Hi, welcome everyone. It's great to have you here. We're going to start in a few minutes as people roll in. In the meantime, if you're wondering where my voice is coming from, I am playing Oz today. I'm the wizard behind the curtain, so you won't be able to see me, but I wanted to jump on to greet all of you. I know we're all very excited for this conversation today. Believe it or not, this is now our fourth HR at the Table webinar, and we have compiled so many great ideas, insights, and resources for HR leaders like you. If you ever want to recap the event or study up some on some additional input based on insight from these discussions, check out our blog page where we deep dive into all of our HR at the Table episodes. So far, we've talked with IBM about the reinvention of HR, MSI about CEO and HR alignment, and True Blue about the intersection of HR tech and work. And today, we're just gonna uncover more concepts, tips, and strategies in the HR and TA space. We have some great webinars planned for the rest of this year, so if you enjoy this one, make sure to mark your calendars for our next events and keep up to the date on the topics we're talking about. If you have attended those previous HR at the Table episodes I mentioned, let us know. This is a great time to test out that chat functionality, so tell us which webinars you've attended and what key points you remember. If you haven't attended one of these webinars before, no worries, it is great to have you here. You can still test out that chat functionality by dropping where you're calling from in the chat. We love to see how we're able to connect with people all over the world in this virtual space. I personally, I'm out here in Boise, Idaho, and uh, it's a bit cloudy, but we're headed into sunshine later this week, so I'm pretty happy about that. If you haven't tested out that chat function yet, now is a great time to let us know what the weather is like where you're calling from. That is, if you've even been outside today. I personally haven't, but luckily I have a nice window view here at my home office, and I can see that it's cloudy out. All right, well, it looks like we've got a good amount of people loaded in, so I wanted to kick us off by saying hello and welcome to another podcast style webinar episode of HR at the Table, where Ben Cornett at Verified First talks with HR and talent acquisition leaders from some of America's most notable companies about their roles at the executive table. But before we get going too fast, we have some things to keep in mind. Remember that chat functionality we all tested out? Use it. We would love to hear the questions you have from today's discussion and we'll answer as many as we can throughout the webinar and at the end. FYI, this webinar is being recorded, so you can use it as a resource and watch it whenever you want. So, without further, without further ado, take it away, Ben. Awesome. Thank you so much. Hi, welcome. And uh, so excited to be here today. Another interview in our HR at the table. And today I get the privilege to chat with. Uh, uh, quite a professional here. Um, I don't know how that rings on my computer here, but I'm pretty excited about today. Um, also, I'd like to really quickly shout out our sponsor, Bamboo HR, for sponsoring today's episode of HR at the Table. To our listeners, thank you for tuning in. If you've heard us before, thank you for coming back. If this is your first time, as uh, you heard, come and uh, take a look at what we got. We're trying to create some great content for HR and talent acquisition leaders across the country. Um, Today, we're going to chat a little bit about talent, tech, and brand. Uh, we call it the effective for return. We know that maximizing return on investment and human resources and talent acquisition are one of the core functions of today's CHRO. So if you're the CHRO, uh, trying to get that return on your investment and human resource talent acquisition is important. And with COVID-19, it's kind of re-emphasized such. Uh, to help us explore the impact of employment branding, uh, HR tech and talent companies today, we have the Director of Talent Acquisition at Prestige Care, Blake Thies, Thies I think you said it is, is with yep. us. Good morning. Hey, thanks for having me, Ben. Really excited to, to be here and, and bring value to uh, our audience here. It should be a great conversation. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I know we chatted a little bit before. You're not too far away from Boise, out there on the West Coast. Um, Vancouver, just outside of Portland, Oregon, for those of those who don't know the West Coast, maybe. We have people all over the country. And uh, I think uh, you said it's sunny? That's kind of strange. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it, usually it's raining sideways here in the Coop, Ben, but, uh, you know, we, we, we've got 70 degree weather. I'm, I'm looking outside here. It's gorgeous. Got some nice natural light coming in here. So, yeah, we got some nice weather. We're going to be doing some hiking this weekend, which uh, is something I really enjoy. So. Yeah, looking forward to a, a great conversation today, but more importantly, even uh, better outdoors time this weekend. 
Yeah. So Blake, maybe just take a moment, tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about Prestige Care for our audience. Yeah, thanks, Ben. So a little bit about me. I'm the uh, Director of Talent Acquisition here for Prestige Care and a little bit about the company, Prestige Care, family owned and operated, been around since 1985, headquartered here in Vancouver, Washington. Uh, we own and operate about 75 assisted living and skilled nursing care centers up and down the West Coast mainly in Oregon, Washington, and Idaho, but our footprint does extend down into California, Nevada, Arizona, and the furthest east we go is actually Kalispell, Montana. So we're family-owned, West Coast, uh, national award-winning company. Many of our buildings win national quality care awards. So, you know, we are in the senior care space. You know, half of our buildings are in the assisted living memory care side of senior care. And then the other half are in the uh, skilled nursing post-acute side. So we primarily support and care for and love on seniors, um, have about 5,000 team members enterprise-wide, and we serve about 5,000 residents. You know, they aren't patients or clients, they're residents. We work where they live. And so that's a little bit about the company. Love, love the organization. I've been here at Prestige for a shade under six years. The first three years were in an individual contributor role as a leadership recruiter supporting the assisted living vertical of our business. And then about two and a half years ago, I was very blessed and very lucky to be asked to serve in the newly created director role. And in, in that role that I've been in for the last about probably two and a half years at this point, uh, I oversee all functional areas of talent acquisition enterprise-wide. So anything relative to the applicant tracking system, employer branding, coaching, guiding, teaching on all things recruiting and TA. Basically, anything under the TA umbrella, I take extreme ownership to ensure that uh, our systems and our, our game is tight and we're offering the best uh, in experience to, to both passive and active applicants. Um, outside of my work uh, here at Prestige Care, I'm, I actually get to speak at state and national conferences, something I really, really love to do. Uh, I was blessed to speak a couple summers ago at the National Association for Healthcare Recruiting's uh, annual conference in Philadelphia. And I've also spoken at SourceCon, as well as ERE Media's um, conferences, both in 2018 uh, and then at, for ERE, it was uh, uh, spring of 2019. So yeah, that's what I get to do, kind of a, on the side, as it were. Love what I do. I live and breathe talent acquisition and I really love employer branding, brand wins. and. Really excited to kind of dive in deep uh, with you. Yeah, yeah we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about that. And, I, you know, I think I do have to mention you and your wife are expecting your first child. So, you know, congratulations, little boy, coming up in, uh, you know, uh, what, six or eight weeks, somewhere in there. Coming up here, Ben, it's it's going to be a, a big change, but we're very blessed. We're very lucky, excited to, to welcome little little baby boy into this world. So yeah. we're, we're really looking forward to that. You may have to move some of the books on your bookshelf there behind you a little bit higher. Um, oh, yeah, I guess. Over here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, awesome. Awesome. Well, Blake, you know, um, again, thank you for coming to today's interview at our HR at the table. And I think you probably know better than any of us, you know, with Prestige Care being in that healthcare vertical, you know, and we're right in the middle of a pandemic still. And I would imagine your talent acquisition strategy has really been tested at times. Could you share a little bit more detail what you guys went through with COVID 19? As a director, of I'm sure it's <laughs> understatement of the year. Understatement of the year, Ben. Sorry, I thought, sorry to cut you off there, but yeah, you know, I when I look back on the last, geez, 12, 13, 14 months, um, you know, I, I, I the, the the first word that comes to mind is fluid. You know, we we had our our approach before, you know, pretty successful, but you know, this industry, really healthcare from the macro, has been just turned upside down and it has forced us to evolve, um, you know, try different things, lean in on different approaches. You know, for us, as, as I kind of ruminate, especially over the last seven, eight months relative to recruiting, you know, we've gone pretty much all in on highlighting our own employees, showing gra uh, gratitude, um, illuminating the work that our team members are doing. If anybody checks us out on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, at Job the Prestige, uh, my team and I run all of that and create all that content. And we've done a really cool job of highlighting the great work that these everyday heroes, and I don't use that term lightly. I mean, these are the people that, that work for us are true heroes. And, you know, it, it, it was pretty, 
I don't want to use the term sketchy, but challenging, uh, especially those first few months of, of the um, of the pandemic. And and thankfully, we we see the light at the end of the tunnel with vaccine clinics rolled out at all of our care centers and communities. And you know, we're we're getting to a sense of normalcy. But you know, we've really had to be fluid with our approach and evolve and try different things. I've always been one to you know sprint towards the unknown and sprint towards things that haven't been tried and. We've really done a lot of that as well the last you know, 12, 13, 14 months. Yeah, we've heard that actually in several interviews we've already done is, you know, kind of grab grab the bull and run, right? Um, to, to keep up in a lot of cases. And, you know, that digital transformation for a lot of organizations came on suddenly as a result of COVID. Yeah. Um, were you guys prepared when COVID hit for that transformation all of a sudden to digital? Or is that something you like, scramble to find the best solution as fast as you could. Just kind of curious if you guys kind of had a contingency plan ready before COVID hit. Yeah, like most companies, whether they're small, medium sized like, our, like ours or large, you know, we, we weren't prepared. Um, I would say my hat is off to, to our IT team, our chief clinical officer, Tom Rollins, has been a phenomenal leader and partner, and it has really shepherded us through, uh, through, through COVID here. But you know, we, we really scrambled to evolve and, and leaned into different solutions. Like many, we leveraged Zoom for video interviewing, uh, really leaned into utilizing Teams for instant messaging and things like that. You know, I really do miss interacting in person, not only with our regional, regional, regional ops folks as well, but, uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, we, like many companies, we've made the most of it and, uh, you know, I think back to you know the, the in-person meetings we used to have. Now they're on digital. My hat is off to my colleagues for just be, having the audacity to evolve during just unprecedented times. That phrase has been thrown around 50 million billion times. <laughs> but you know, my we we you know, to answer your question, Ben, we definitely weren't prepared. But you know, like other outfits, we we rolled with the punches and and we made it work. And I'm proud to say that we're really you know kind of thriving through this and thing you're at the end of this 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 mess <laughs> well awesome blake we're, we're going to dive in in here just a second about maybe how that came to fruition for you all just a reminder to our audience take a moment if you have any questions or we're having our chat today feel free to smoke, submit those as questions or in the chat feature of uh go to webinar it's in the right side the control panel on your screen um you know blake so you guys clearly were able to recruit and hire during the pandemic um and you know, we talked just briefly, and this is what intrigued us to get on an interview is, you know, you're passionate about brand, um, technology, and talent, and those three things come together to create this trifecta that we're going to talk about. So why don't we dive into that just a little bit here, and maybe you can uh, navigate us as we, we go through uh, what that looks like. So, you know, often oftentimes, you know, brand and why it matters, HR and talent acquisition leaders don't take that into account. You know, they don't think about their company's brand. They don't think about the market position, whether you're, you're small or mid-sized, you have local market. They just don't take the recognition of the work that's went behind the scenes to make that brand stand out. Mm -hmm. um, why, why do you think it is that sometimes, you know, HR and talent acquisition professionals just kind of forget that aspect or maybe it's just not a priority for them? Well, I think, I think that's a great question, Ben. I, the, the first thing that comes to mind is it's, tough to measure, right? It's tough to measure the uh, ROI on creating employer branding materials and things like that. I mean, you can, from a TA standpoint, you can say, well, we can look at our total applicant flow, you know, two years ago versus a year ago versus now, you know, you could look at those types of matrices and that could be indicative of just uh, impact, overall impact on employer brand. So I think, you know, number one, it, it's pretty challenging to measure. I think number two, you know, employer branding materials are pretty costly to produce. Um, right. I think that's a big roadblock that impede HR practitioners, TA practitioners like myself to really lean into brand. Um, I, you know, when I was asked to serve in this director role, I developed what I call the talent acquisition triangle, basically my strategic approach to how we are going to win recruiting. Um, in a highly competitive environment. And one of the corners of that triangle was building out a robust, identifiable employment brand. Brand wins. It's a reason why you'll go to Starbucks around the corner 
maybe pay four fifteen, four twenty-five for that three-shot iced Americano like I drink. But you go to that that drive-through kind of mom and pop shop around the corner and pay, you know, three twenty-five. You're paying for brand. It's identifiable. And so brand, in my opinion, and this is one TA practitioner's take, I guess, it it is the it is it is the move, right? I mean, here locally and where I'm at. You know, we have some major employers, the Nikes of the world, Adidas, uh, Providence is a huge healthcare provider here. It's why those outfits get massive amounts of applications, uh, whereas, you know, some smaller outfits, they don't, it's literally the complete opposite. So I, I think to answer your question, Ben, really, it's, it's all of that. And I think that's why a lot of HR and TA practitioners don't really lean into to, to building out a brand. They don't have the time. I mean... That's another big thing too. I mean, <laughs> I'm a working manager myself, um, but not a lot of HR practitioners have the capacity to create content at scale. Furthermore, they don't have the financial resources to then outsource that. So I think that's why that's not, not executed. I think for us here at Prestige and specifically, you know, my practice in collaboration with my team's practice is we just buck the trend. We say, you know what? We don't have the financial resources to do this. And that's all right. We're going to create it ourselves. And we're going to collaborate with our in-house marketing folks and be really gritty and use the resources that we have. So I, you know, when I think about brand and, and you know, my strategic approach here at Prestige, not only Prestige, but my own personal brand, one of my goals this year was to grow it through video. I should have been doing this five, six, seven years ago. And because back then I thought, oh, well, we need to pay some outfit to, to you know, create yeah. this content, blah, blah, blah. But guess what, everybody? We've got supercomputer video production materials or uh, pieces of hardware in our pocket shooting 4K video. Insanity, yeah. what's going on? And so if, if a kid from Salem, Oregon, like myself, can teach himself how to cut video and, and, and make it happen, I'm confident you can. It all comes down to execution. Um, if I can do it, you can do it. So I think to answer your question, Ben, it's a, it's a long-winded answer, but I think those are the reasons why people don't lean into brand in the HR and TA space. Yeah. Are, are there a couple of examples, Blake, that stand out from you um, from Prestige Care as a brand that maybe you can share with the audience of maybe specific examples where you guys have built that brand recognition in the communities that you hire that, mm. that people can take away some ideas? Mm. Yeah, great question here. So a couple different thoughts. This and got to go back. Each, 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 each like each year, to be honest with you, Ben. But this is probably oh shoot, last summer, June, July, 2020. Um, you know, all of our buildings had been closed to family members and visitors uh, to curtail COVID-19. And uh, our maintenance director in Caldwell, Idaho. Right over the road, right down the road from you there, uh, Ben in, in Boise. He created what's called the Hug and Hut. Basically, it was this uh, piece of plastic that was wrapped around PVC, and there were holes in it where where a loved one could put their arms in to hug mom, dad, whomever the case may be. And our executive director filmed that, and the executive director and head of operations sent it to me, and I said, "This is this is awesome stuff. We need to get this out there." I mean. We need something good to share with, you know, with society, really. And uh, I actually posted that on my personal Facebook, LinkedIn, and the company's outlets as well. And combined through all of those outlets, it got over a million views. So I, I like to think of that as my first kind of piece of viral content. People want to see good. People want to see heartwarming tales uh, and, and just the good, especially the last 12 to 14 months. And so I, I think that was, you know, when, when we think about brand, like highlight the good in your organization, highlight your own team members. I mean, at least here at, at Prestige Care, we have so many awesome people who have worked with us for 10, 15, 20 years you know, or worked their way up. I know everybody on this call, if you're an HR leader, TA leader, dig for those stories and highlight those stories on social media which by the way is free, which is a great price, and share those stories because that can help build brand, positive brand recognition, in not only in your local marketplace, but in your industry as a whole. And to take it a step further, 
You can run sponsored ads in, in uh, on social against various geo markets and against various interests and things of that nature to further get your brand out there. Um, so I would I would say it's it's that, but also um, yeah, I guess I'll leave it at that, Ben. You know, just always look for the stories and highlight those stories because people want to read it. People want to see that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And I, you know, kind of resonate with me, you know, as a marketing director, you would imagine brands close and dear to me too. So really, you know, I, I like the example, Tony Shea, you know, the founders of Zappos, the online shore system. I don't know if you know this, but you can dial the 1-800 Zappos number still today. And you can put, I think it's option five and you get the joke of the day. So if you need to go jo good joke, go call Zappos, option five and get the joke of the day. But you know, Tony Shea defined brand as culture in an organization. Um, do you feel that that's right in, in that definition? And if yes, why? And if not, why not? I think yes. I, I, my, my initial just gut response then is yes, because it is the experience that one has as a team member. We call them team members here, prestige or a uh, employee of, a, of an organization. It's just the culture. It is what one can experience if they choose to yeah. come work for you. You know, I, I, I was telling you before this started, Ben, I was, uh, I was sort of on another board here locally for other healthcare recruiters. And, you know, people have so many choices on where they can work. Everybody's hiring right now. I mean, I'm sure if you drive around Meridian, Boise, where you're at, or Vancouver, Portland, or insert city X here, you're going to see a lot of people without now hiring signs. So it's, you know, Everybody is looking for people, and so that's why building out and being intentional about building a brand can get people more more folks to apply to your jobs and your career opportunities. But to answer your question, yeah, I think it's culture. Brand is your culture, and uh, and vice versa. So yeah, I'd agree with that. Well, I think it's really interesting, kind of a leeway into one of the questions from our audience members, from Kurt. So Kurt, thank you for your question and uh, just reminding others, we're gonna answer those if we can. So Kurt's question is really, I think, related to this in a weird way. So paying competitively, right? He says paying competitively is difficult in our industry. Um, I'm not quite sure what industry Kurt is in, but in his industry, getting that competitive pay is up. So how do you manage locations um, so you can pay as competitively as possible? And I, I would assume, I'm making a big assumption here, Blake, that a good solid brand, a employer of choice, you know, we take pride in Idaho being an employer of choice, um, I think, you know, plays into that competitive pay. It's probably more than just pay that's probably the answer. Absolutely. And, you know, that's a that's a great question, Kurt, and I know our, our colleagues are on this call, regardless of industry, are probably running into similar issues. We run into it here at Prestige. And, you know, I, I think Somebody says money doesn't matter. I'm going to call baloney on that. I, I think money is, is is a big is a big driver, especially in a higher cost of living area like the the West Coast. And unfortunately, Boise is getting there. Unfortunately, but um, you know, really how to combat that? I think that's really the heart of the question here. Is really go all in, and maybe you can't raise your wages, and be that as it may, because you have budgets to adhere to things that whatever. What, how we approach that is what are the tangible things that you can highlight at scale that make you different? So for us, it is just what we've been talking about, that it's our culture. I mean, many of our caregivers and communities win national quality care awards for quality care of our residents. And so we really push that, we drive that in all of our job postings. You can go on our job postings. We, wrote, we, we, we rewrote all of our job announcements. And if any of our buildings won, either a, a state or national award, you, you bet your bottom dollar we put that on there. That's a brand differentiator. We want to be different because different gets eyeballs on what you have to offer. I think number two as well, at least for us, is we have a really strong promote from within culture. It's not just recruiter HR guy saying, hey, we do promote from within. Honestly, four years ago, we didn't do, we didn't promote from within well. I'll tell you what, the last 18, 24, uh, 30 months here at Prestige, we're doing a phenomenal job of that. Not just we've built out systems in which we can promote people into, but we're willingly promoting people into. So yeah. highlighting that as well in all of your, your employer branding materials can really resonate with people. People want to know that they have a home where they choose to work 
and then they're going to be promoted. They're going to be able to earn more, have better, um, you know, higher job titles and things of that nature. People want to know that. You know, I, I, I actually use this example quite often, especially internally when I do internal um, trainings, which I'm doing later on today, ironically enough. I'm an elder millennial myself, right? And people always ask me, how do you keep millennials or how do you attract and, and keep millennials? I think the bigger issue should be how do you keep and attract Gen Z? But, uh, um, you know, how do you keep millennials? Honestly, it's train them up, hire awesome people who have a great heart, train them up, set clear expectations, and get the heck out of the way and willingly promote them. People will stay with you. I truly believe that. So I think back to your question, I think it's, Ben, I, th I think it's really going all in on your brand differentiators. What are those three things at your company, whoever's on this call, what are those three things that you do different and you do really stinking well? And I would 10X, 20X your efforts to get that EVP, that employer value proposition out into the marketplace, whether it be with paid media, on your social feeds, on any external facing outlets, you know, job announcements. And, and by the way, this isn't just for TA and recruiting. I mean, get it up on your website, maybe integrate it into Google pages. I mean, really the, the, the use cases are endless, but I don't get out there in as many different outlets as you can. Awesome. You know, it's really interesting. Kurt, thank you for the question. Hopefully that's a little bit helpful. Uh, we had another question kind of related to brand before we transition a little bit about uh, into, you know, connecting the tech and brand. Um, I think it's interesting. It says we already have a strong brand. What are some examples of ways that we can leverage that for talent acquisition? I, I kind of think that more naturally transition us into the, uh, the technology conversation somewhat, which we can go there. But it's interesting, so that question came from Karen. Thank you, Karen. And right immediately after that question, uh, we get Charlotte saying, thank you for the hug. She liked that story, so thanks, Blake. Uh, um, yeah. But Karen, really quick, you know, as we think about, as we're developing this brand and we have a strong brand, you know, I'm an organization, what are some examples that we could leverage that brand with technology as we move into talent acquisition? How can we le leverage that brand leveraging technology or, yeah. You talked about, technology. Yeah, you talk so, about some of the avenues, you know, or yeah. are there other things outside of that that maybe HR and talent acquisition professionals should think about? Yeah, so I think, I, you know, the, the thing that comes to my mind's eye here, Ben, and, and we haven't done this a lot, but, and it's because it all comes down to execution, but, you know, leveraging some sort of programmatic uh, inbound recruitment marketing, whether it be email or text sharing with your community some of the great things that that brand or that organization is doing whether it be a, a, a an award that you win or you know we partnered with with that this outfit here in the Boise area and we were able to raise it you know we were able to you know bring in 10,000 pounds of food for the Boise food bank something like that so leveraging you know basic technology in that way um, I think that is a great use case um, when, when we think about tech and brand. Um, you know, I, I think also just going all in on, on um, I, I guess, let me take a step back here, Ben. You know, I think if you have a really strong brand, I don't think you need to get too cute with, with, with it relative to tech. I think you just get get it out there if you have a strong brand if you were and i'm just thinking locally here like a, a nike or an adidas or a precision cast parts or locally in the portland area just be you know go go you know lean more into inbound inbound um engagement you know that's something that's been really on my mind's eye lately is don't just wait for people go and engage people so you know leveraging whatever technology that's going to allow you to uh, proactively engage people and in a perfect world, programmatically engage people. Um, I think that is a, a great move for, for folks, whether you have a smaller brand, smaller company or a bigger brand, because we're all operating very lean anymore. So we need to leverage technology uh, to really, you know, 10X, 20X our efforts. Yeah, I wrote on my, I'm gonna use the word you used earlier on my sticky note here, and it says, be fluid. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, really adopting what's available. 
Now, you know, we, we ran a research study back in December of last year, um, kind of at the end of the year, looking forward into 2021 with aptitude research. And in the study, this was a third party independent study of Verified First. And it was interesting that we found that, uh, I must say the number was either five or six talent acquisition and HR professional, or, or talent acquisition and HR professionals were using between five and six platforms to manage their recruiting and hire process. So I guess in your world, Blake, talent acquisition, what does that look like? I mean, you have everything magical in one platform, you have a number of platforms plugged together. Um, you know, what role does technology play when it comes into getting the right talent in the door in your role? Yeah, that's a great question. I, you know, one of my favorite books, and I would really encourage everybody on the call to check it out is Essentialism. Basically, the idea of it, and I'm sure a lot of folks here on the call have, have at least heard of it or uh, have read it. Um, it's basically, uh, you know, less but better, right? Like finding the, the the best thing that is going to get you from point A to point B. At least for us here at Prestige, you know, like you can invest hundred, and believe me, there's enough vendors out there that they have a solution for you. But um, you know, for us here at, at Prestige, we have really um, three, two, two or three kind of main pieces of tech. And, and this is just relative to, to talent acquisition, Ben. So we have our applicant tracking system that does, it, it's very robust. Healthcare source is the name of it. And we've been able to uh, integrate some nice products into that, um, in, into that ATS, into their ecosystem. I guess I'll just use that terminology. But, you know, leveraging interview self-scheduling software, we were able to integrate that texting out of that system has been a game changer for us so interacting with candidates in real time where their eyeballs are at that's really key um and then we also have a separate crm um candidate relationship management tool uh because so much of what we do here at prestige is engage passive job seekers that's so so much of what we do um and, and so we leverage GEM, which is our CRM. I'm a huge, huge fan of, of them and, and uh, the, the value they provide us. But, you know, we only leverage two, two main systems. However, the, the main hub, that ATS, there's a number of different tech that are integrated. integrated. It's a really kind of a one-stop shop. And again, back to my comments about essentialism, you know, getting, getting to just two or three names. Three because we live in yeah. such a different such a world so, so for our attention. So I think if for our attention. So I think if you can be different outlets different outlet source, you won't be chasing you won't, you won't be chasing you won't be something that's all. That's all. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's really, really interesting, Blake. You know, we think about the technology and I just got a note here that we might have a little bit of echo going on, so I'm just watching that note, but um, hopefully all of our audience and our listeners can still hear us and follow along. I, I think you're really, really right. You know, that essentialism is getting the technology right, but, you know, in today's world where turnaround time is so important, right, and time to fill and, you know, all those metrics that HR leaders are measuring to get the, you know, the best ROI possible, it's, it's also important, I think, maybe even more important to think about that candidate experience. Yeah. When you guys look at technology, Blake, do you guys, I, I mean, are you looking for both uh, on efficiency and reducing those metrics and uh, that candidate experience? Or if, if you were to say which one of those two is most important, what would your take be? Because they're both well, important. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, honestly, I think it's a, I think it's a both, Ben. When I think of efficiency and candidate experience, I think they're, I think they're married. Great example. Yeah. So um, a great example, I, I kind of hinted at it a, a few moments earlier, like being able to text candidates out of my ATS, that is, a, that is a phenomenal solution because it's not only efficient, email is inefficient because we all get 5 million emails, right? But texting is efficient on the employer side because I can interact with people that have applied for my job. But from a, can from a CX standpoint, from a candidate experience standpoint, People, they, they want to interact with a human being, right? They don't want to interact. They, you know, common frustration that candidates have is I apply for a job. My info goes into a black hole. I don't hear from a human being or the bot got my resume. <laughs> I'm hearkening to my, my friend, Amy Miller, who has a lot of comments about that. But, um, 
uh, you know, I think candidate experience and efficiency really is married in that text message example. So, uh, so I'd say part A. You know, another thing that that one might think about that you know folks on this call could think about is making it as easy as possible for candidates to apply. Here's a great example for everybody. Um, and shame on me, I didn't know this, but went through the process of applying for one of our jobs, found out that our application process was 21 pages. 21 pages, that is insane. And I said, we gotta, we gotta shorten this sucker as soon as humanly possible. So we got down to what was only essential, back to my essentialism comment, and we shrunk it down to five really short sections of our application process. So we shrunk it um, by 75%. And by the way, for everybody on this call, go through the process of applying for one of your jobs. Seriously, don't assume, I assume, shame on me. Physically go through that process and do, go through that process with a fine tooth comb because that's what your candidate is experiencing. Back to our, our, our CX comments. So again, efficiency, candidate experience, in my opinion, is, is married and they're really one and the same. So finding efficiencies will allow a more positive candidate experience, in my opinion. Yeah, I think that's good, good, good recommendation. So, you know, again, we put these HR at the tables to uh, webinar series together so people can learn from our own mistakes. So thanks for being vulnerable there, Blake. I wanna shift gears a bit, reminding everyone the chat and the question's still open. Let's do a quick audience poll. So ver verified first, We've been uh, doing a year-long poll. This is our fourth poll. I want you to I'm gonna launch this on the screen real quick. And we'll give our audience just a few minutes to uh, vote. Here. So that should be popping up in your screen. Um, give everyone just a second for that to come up. So the question is, what areas of technology are you looking to replace in the next six months? And you can select multiple here. So we're gonna watch that poll come in. Um, take a moment, if you're listening to our webinar, let us know that you're still there. Um, that you're still with us, and we'd love to hear your uh, comments here. Again, this is a year-long poll. We're gathering data as we go throughout all of our HR at the Table series. And, uh, you know, Blake, it's interesting. When you think about replacing technology, um, you know, we're not going to talk too much about this, but as we're waiting for the poll questions to come in, you know, what are the, you know, from, from your perspective, I don't know how close you are to this, you know, as talent acquisition versus, you know, corporate HR, obviously. But what are some of the challenges when organizations are looking to replace technology? Is it integration and we have to go through that all again? I mean, what are the pain points? Just curious. Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest with you then candidly, I haven't been through a process as a decision maker when we replace technology. Um, I know currently we're going through the process of, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, replacing our HRIS just with an upgraded version of Kronos, actually. And I'm kind of adjacent to that project. I haven't been, you know, sitting on the uh, decision-making team. So, you know, candidly, I haven't been part of that process. However, you know, in the absence of that experience, I, I think for me, whenever I consider any sort of new piece of technology, I think it's ease of use. I think it's got to be really easy to use, very user friendly, because people will use it and get into whatever that solution may be. I, I would just really encourage everyone on this call, you know, go through that that you know the the RFP process, hear what vendors have to say, and really lean into what is the easiest thing for us. What 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 is the most user friendly piece? Um, you know, when I think about when I think about some of the, the common pitfalls that in-house TA and HR practitioners face, especially when it, when it comes to recruiting staff, is you know they don't get into the applicant tracking system, they're not processing applicants, we're not moving fast enough, things like that. But if your systems are, are easy to use and easy to kind of execute through, people will invest their time in doing that. So I, I would really, I mean, that would be my default in any yeah. sort of piece of technology. Is it easy to use? Yes or no? If it isn't, go to the next one. Because <laughs> there are options out there. It's interesting, as I look at this poll question as we've evolved over the last three months, the, the results every month are pretty similar. You know, we see a lot of organizations, nearly half are not looking at any replacements. Um, you know, part of my, in my mind is, oh, did you already go through system changes while you were in COVID because you had 
time and bandwidth to do that. But uh, nonetheless, interesting, interesting to see that this is pretty much there are organizations looking to replace technology and you know, those, those can be painful moments. So I, I saw 15% say they're looking to replace their CRM. You know, Blake, you use the CRM. So maybe there's some, uh, I think you called it gem. Maybe someone can look them up and, uh, you know, obviously reach out at the end. Um, yeah. what, I wanna kind of continue on and transition a little bit. We talked about brand, we talked about technology and our last leg of the trifecta, if you will, is talent. And um, I just, maybe, maybe, um, Tell us a little bit about the relationship between you and talent acquisition and corporate HR. Mm. What's that look like? I know, I think a couple of weeks ago we met briefly, you told me you had a new new head of HR, I think. Was yeah. that you? Yeah, yeah, that was that was us. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I um I, I actually had some pretty unique background, me myself. You know, most PA practitioners and recruiting professionals, they fell in to recruiting. I am I am one of those weird kids, Ben. I actually have a degree in human resources management and from Pacific Lutheran University in Tacoma, Washington. Um, nonetheless, I'm actually doing what I set out to do over a decade ago. And I've been in HR my entire career. Kind of the first half of it, I sat in that HR generalist, HR VP seat. And then I transitioned full time into, into TA. So I have a really unique um, approach to talent acquisition because I have sat in that HRBP seat. So I guess here at Prestige Care, you know, our um, strategic approach, specifically on the skilled nursing vertical of our business, is our regional talent acquisition partners and our HR business partners really are married at the hip because. You know, our HR, pardon me, our RTAP, Regional Talent Acquisition Partners, need to be able to communicate to the HRBPs, hey, you know, I see massive turnover in the staff RN role at this, at this one care center. You know, I, I'm hearing that there's wage issues out there. HRBP, I need, to, I need you to do a wage analysis. I need you to understand why people are leaving. So then HRBP, you can give me some guidance as well as work with a local operator to make some strategic changes. So at least for us here at Prestige, really it's, it's, a, it's a marrying of both. And I think that's one, one reason why I really love how we're, how we're set up. We have four regional talent acquisition partners supporting the skilled nursing vertical of our business. And we're going to now have four HRBPs. And so I think the structure is very, con, I guess, congruent and conducive to total, I'm gonna use the term total staffing success. It's recruiting, getting people in the door, they're through the door, the handoff is there, and then the HRBP Any HR practitioner here, especially if you work for a medium or larger size organization like us, you, I would have monthly meetings with your, with your recruiting department, talent acquisition folks, to find congruency and, and, and really open up the lines of dialogue. It's not us versus them. Find figure out really quick how y'all can work together because if you can find congruence uh, between the two, you can keep people longer. And that's what this all boils down to is retention. You know, yeah. that is a huge issue in, in definitely in my company, definitely in healthcare, but you know, in, in all areas of, of the economy, it, it all comes down to retention. How do you keep your people? That's a conversation for a whole other day, Ben. <laughs> yeah, whole other webinar, right? Let's just oh, yeah. attention. You know, it's really interesting. And it, that kind of plays back into that brand conversation, right? The, the stronger the brand present, the stronger the, the culture, right? If you will, in Tony yeah. Chase, you know, the stronger that is and the stronger the connection between TA and talent acquisition or uh, HR that you mentioned, Blake, really the better retention is going to be. So um, what, what, you know, how, how or what extent does brand and technology connect with the candidate experience. How do you see those connecting? So we talk about talent and tech, right? Yeah. How do they really connect the end of the day to that 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 candidate experience? Yeah, that's a that's a good question, Ben. You know, my my initial thought, and I made reference to this earlier, is, um, and we can do, you know, to be candid, we can do a better job of, of this. Is is not just sending drip email and text campaigns because we're hiring for a job it's 
proactively sending messaging about some of the great things that we're doing. So leveraging the technology to talk about the brand using the, I'm, I'm gonna use the term nurture, nurture those passive candidates, showing that this is a great place to work because of X, Y, Z, or those, those three things that I mentioned earlier, the, the three kind of pieces of your employer value proposition that make you, make you different. So, you know, I would say leveraging, leveraging tech. So I'm just thinking in my mind's eye, like a CRM, you know, sending a drip campaign out of, out of CRM. We can, like I said, we can do a better job at that. Um, you know, I think the second piece of it um, is, is leveraging video. I know I kind of mentioned that earlier, but, you know, utilizing the technology that we have in our pockets here to create content um, and to distribute that content, whether it be in that, in that drip email campaign or on a landing page or an updated website uh, or career site or something like that. Or, you know, here's a, another great example, you know, when, when you book a uh, interview with a candidate, for instance, because these folks have so many different places they can work, proactively sending them a personalized video. You know, hey, Ben, really excited to be chatting with you on, on uh, Thursday at 2 p.m. about our registered nurse job, you know. Um, my name's Blake. I'm going to be, you know, on the interview panel. Looking forward to hearing more about you and and what we can offer you. I think that's something I really want to drive home. This you didn't really ask this question, Ben, but I'm just going to go down this road anyway. This is huge um, for anybody that gets involved in recruiting and just talent acquisition. It's not about you. It's all about them. It's what can your brand offer them in the short and long term. So leveraging any sort of technology to show what is in it for the candidate, that is going to resonate. And that's what we should be going kind of all in on. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. You know, you and I both and probably everyone on this call uh, goes to a million video conferences now. Every, every, it seems like they never end back to back, back. Um, yep. But it's interesting in the very beginning when COVID hit, you know, I think, you know, people were really reluctant to share video. And, yep. and now today, everyone's gotten comfortable with seeing themselves and hearing themselves. So it, it's interesting to see that transition. Was as a result of COVID, I know we only have uh, about 10 minutes, a little over 10 minutes left here. As a result of COVID, did anything, did anything come to forefront that was missing in your talent acquisition strategy in what, you know, in, in regards to tech or brand initiatives or needs for talent to be able to effectively recruit? That's a really good question, Ben. Was well, there something that, uh, like, oh, we need to go address this quick? Yeah, well, I, I think, uh, you know, the kind of the low hanging fruit was, you know, the, the uh, leveraging video interviewing. I mean, earlier on in the pandemic, we did a platform to interview people, uh, not only just for rank and file roles that are skilled nursing and assisted living communities, but also for um, leadership roles. So here at Prestige Care, um, we, we actually have a, a pretty robust uh, recruitment process for leaders at these skilled nursing and assisted living communities. I mean, the final step of our process is, well, pre-COVID, we used to fly people from wherever they were at to our central support office to meet in person with two out of uh, our three kind of executive leaders. Uh, and, you know, when COVID hit, we didn't have a solution for that. And so we had to evolve. And so, you know, like many companies, we, we leverage Zoom uh, as, as well as Teams, but primarily Zoom. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I know a lot, of, a lot of outfits out there are trying to find ways to meet folks in a virtual environment for hiring events and things like that. You know, I, I'm really torn on virtual hiring events, to be honest with you. You know, we've tried a few of them just with minimal results. I know there's a couple of really good vendors that do a good job uh, of, of developing a platform for that. I think that really the, the big key there is to get the word out about those virtual hiring events and the, the utilizing the platforms you have. But, you know, I think to answer your question, you know, we weren't prepared for video interviewing, nor were we prepared for a virtual kind of hiring event environment. And, you know, we've addressed that in some ways, other ways we haven't, you know, we've just been, and like a lot of other companies on this call, you know, surviving. Um, the last 12, 13 months. Yeah. Uh, so maybe one last question before we wrap up here. Um, so Mark uh, posted a question for us there in the chat. Of, uh, it looks like, do you know of any resources where we can learn better how to use LinkedIn Recruiter? 
Um, and I know this is off the cuff question, so you might not use LinkedIn Recruiter, but uh, any recommendations to help our friend Mark? Yeah, you know we don't we don't use LinkedIn Recruiter because the because uh, the 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 fish that we're fishing for don't hang out in that pond, <laughs> as it yeah. were. Um, I haven't used LinkedIn Recruiter in a number of years, so and you know they they change their kind of interface quite often. Um, I, I wish I could act as a, as a resource. Um, no, it's know, all. Yeah, These are, you know, they're questions that we ask. So uh, appreciate Mark for the question. Uh, you know, we might look at our uh, audience and see if there's anyone that knows. You can chat it up in the chat. So um, I just want to like wrap up as we, we end our conversation today, talking a little bit about, um, you know, value add. So in February, we interviewed Chris Cornine. He's the VP of HR at MSI, which is a hard service enterprise. And the whole conversation there was how to uh, align HR and talent acquisition with the CEO, right? And you know, I guess as you think of talent acquisition there at Prestige Care, Blake, what role do you have in driving return to the bottom line? How, how does what you do impact the financial efficiency of the organization? I want to answer that, but I want to go back to Mark's question because now it's going to bug me. So, <laughs> Mark, <laughs> so I would encourage you a couple great resources uh, and communities that I'd really encourage anybody on this call to get um, to get dialed in with. SourceCon and ERE Media. So SourceCon is all about finding information and finding candidates information and be able to leverage that information and best practices in approaching candidates. So back to the LinkedIn example, hey, that's great that you know that, you know, John is a registered nurse at Legacy Health in Portland. You see him on LinkedIn Recruiter. But, you know, learning how to then approach John in other ways outside of LinkedIn, because John's probably not checking LinkedIn every day. He may not even check it every week, but you need to approach John where he's at, whether it be on social media, whether it be on his personal email, you could go and find his phone number and call him up out of the blue. So getting involved and, and um, getting involved in those communities can help you learn. They have great programming. You know, I've talked to their conferences. I've written for both of those outfits. Um, if, if you really want to level up your sourcing and recruiting knowledge, you know, this is all about tech as well. Then this whole conversation. There's some great tech solutions that you can learn about through SourceCon and ERE Media. So I really encourage you, everybody on this call, you know, get educated, get plugged into the community because there's ways, there's people ways out there you can find who is where, their contact information, and then engage that, that candidate. So I just wanted to kind of call that out. So back to your question, Ben, really about just, it was about just showing value, right? To, yeah, yeah. So what role do you have that shows value at the bottom line? You know, we we have to see C level CEO, CEO language, and you know, how as a talent acquisition professional do you translate what you do into that value? Absolutely. So the thing that comes to mind here is understanding cost of acquisition. So I was on a quest a few months ago to understand what was our cost per hire. And different companies will will um find out or use different, I guess, data points to understand what that was. Um, and for us, I found out that our cost per hire was uh, over the past five years, in, uh, on average, it was only about $230 per hire. I then, um, I wanted to know how did we stand stack up against the market? Not only the post-acute space, assisted living space, but healthcare in general. So just via networking, I got dialed in with an outfit who does a lot of research into this stuff and found out that the average cost per hire, at least last year, 2020, 2019, was around $1,500 per hire. And, and, and honestly, I was actually shocked it was that low. And so I was able to take that data, you know, back to your question, Ben, of, you know, how do you show value, things like that, use that data to say, and, and by the way, I did this, say, hey, look, over the past five years, we're averaging a cost per hire of 230, 230 bucks. You know, this outfit that I've been liaisoning with, who who specializes in stuff, say it's this. So, hey, C-suite, we're getting a boatload of bang for our buck here. 
and the data shows that. So really leaning into data. Um, also, I think then another kind of point to make is is showing how many hires you're making. I know that's kind of the low hanging fruit, but showing that and then showing the average time to fill. And I, I describe time to fill as when we open the job to when the offer is accepted. Um, and then finding benchmarking, find benchmark data that shows how you're stacking up. Because that can show value in the, the value add that TA is, is providing, you know, at least in the healthcare space and in some other industries, but primarily the healthcare space, you know, healthcare outfits, even us, you know, we have to rely on staffing agencies, especially yeah. in some of the yeah. remote markets. And so showing how much agency usage you're using or not using and showing that over time can really show the value add. Um, you can even go a step further as well. You know, we, we think about social media and brand and tech and, you know, if you have some uh, social media outlets, so showing uh, just overall engagement, but overall just followers. I know that's like for some folks, they say, oh, well, whoop de do. You have 4,400 followers. Yeah, I don't care about that. But think about it this way. That's 4,400 free eyeballs on your brand. Um, so I, I think just really lean into data, have the audacity to go out and find benchmarking data, and then take your data, put it up against your benchmarking data, and then use that to show value. I think that's so key. And that's something that I've really tried to lean into, especially the last six, six, seven, eight, nine months here. And, you know, shocking, or maybe not shocking, but um, the, the story has been really positive. I think all things considered, <laughs> in healthcare recruiting in 2019, 2020. So that's what I would say. As positive as it can get, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so it's interesting. Yeah, that. That. yeah, we had a, we had a, again, that third, third party resource that did research for us from Aptitude Research. You know, they found that the average cost to hire in the U.S. is about $4,129. Wow. So, um, you know, you mentioned $1,500, and I think it's all over the map of different organizations. But, you know, when you think about the hiring process, Blake, I think as HR leaders and talent acquisition, you know, it comes back to that retention we talked about and, uh, you know, really, really honing down on what are the processes once you do get someone in the door, you know, that you go through and you follow to make sure that, uh, you know, you're, you're putting the right person in the seat. Because I think we all know the cost to replace someone is a lot. A lot more than 4100 bucks. So um, anyway, I, I just want to wrap up here, Blake. And you know, thank you again so much for your time and spending time with us today. Um, any any last remarks you want to you know call out to our audience, or any last thoughts as we think about the trifecta of talent, tech, and brand? Yeah, I mean, shoot, I could go on and on about this. I mean, it's been a really great conversation, but. I think just some final thoughts is, you know, I think number one, don't let lack of financial resources stop you from taking action, is what I would say. Um, I'm living proof of that. Um, teach yourself. To have the audacity to teach yourself. There's a great thing called YouTube and a great thing called Google. And so you can go in there and say, how to make videos on iMovie or how to make videos on my Dell computer and just teach yourself. I, I mean, I did it. So I think number one, I would really implore everybody, don't let the lack of resources stop you from taking action. I think that's number one. Number two, hyper-personalization. Um, and by the way, this not only on the TA recruiting side, can I get people in the door, but also when they're a team member at your, at your organization, uh, you know, I was having a conversation with, with one of our leaders um, just on this very topic yesterday, Ben, now that I think about it. She was like, you know, we can do all this great, cute stuff to get people in. How the heck am I going to keep them, Blake? And I said, you know, first off, I'm not, I, I'd tell you to talk with your HR VP on this. But my biggest uh, point when I was talking with her yesterday was, you know, ask that, that new team member, what is important to you? Is it words of affirmation? Do you want more money? Is it gifts? Like, what is it? to you, what would resonate with you? And when I think about retention, just um, um, from a scaled standpoint, I think of benefits, not just having like a blanket benefit program, 
I'm actually very bullish on saying, hey, the company would have invested $4,000 a year on benefits for you, new team member. Instead of here are your benefits, I'm going to say you have $4,000 of value. Here's what you could do with that. And here's the platform in which you can you know, select something. Maybe it's childcare. That's a huge issue in healthcare, especially in skilled nursing assisted living. So I'm going to give you a stipend for, for childcare or at least a discount. Or maybe it's continuing education. Maybe that's more important to you. Maybe you have a spouse who's ex-military and you're good to go with benefits. So you don't want to take our benefits. Well, hey, I'm still going to give you benefit value and you can use it in a way that is of value to you. So I think it's hyper-personalization. And I think above all too, when we think about tech and HR and, and recruiting, it's, it's, Look, just because you send an inbound message to somebody or you call them once, that that don't mean they're going to take action, everybody. I think the yeah. overarching idea is between 16 and 20 brand interactions for somebody to then eventually take action on what you're doing. So it can't be a one and done and I'm done and I'm hoping that you'll get back at me. Keep, keep getting your brand out there. Try different avenues as well, whether it be paid paid uh, media, paid digital media, doing stuff like this, you know, whatever the case may be, uh, get your get your name out there and and uh, don't let, just, just keep sprinting towards that and don't let the lack of financial resources stop you because there's a lot of free stuff you can do. Yeah. Well, Blake, it's super awesome advice and super awesome counsel. You know, I, I see your contact information is on the screen. I did see a couple of questions. Uh, looking for the resources that you mentioned. So I'm, uh, I'm guessing people can just email you uh, at the email address and uh, you'd be happy to share those again. And, um, you know, again, Blake, we're grateful for the uh, time that you've taken out to uh, participate day today. And I know you've got a busy schedule ahead the rest of the afternoon, as do many. Uh, just again, thank you. Thank you so much. Also, I'd like to call out a quick thanks to Bamboo HR, who's a sponsor of today's episode of HR at the Table. This HR at the Table was also brought to you by Verified First, and Verified First, we offer a streamlined screening experience with the slick patented browser integration. We instantly connect to over 120 different HR tech platforms, including a Kronos, my friend just mentioned, Bamboo HR and many others. Um, this innovation prevents, uh, provides a client's a turnkey experience with that all American, our company is 100% American, top-notch client care. In fact, you pick up the phone, my folks out there, well, we're in a virtual world, no one's at the office. We'll answer the phone in 30 seconds. So anyway, for more information about us, our only plug is visit us at verifiedfirst.com. Again, thank you, thank you everyone for participating. We'll see you at our next HR at the Table series. We're gonna be talking with the University of Minnesota with Ms. Joy Davis, the head of HR at the University of Minnesota coming up in, I don't know, two or three weeks. I think it's uh, either the sixth or seventh. I don't remember off the top of my head and I don't have my calendar here. So we'll see you all May 6th, it is, hopefully in our next HR at the Table. Have a good afternoon, good evening, good morning, I guess, in some parts of the world. And Blake, again, thank you. We'll see you soon. Yeah, thanks for having me. Cheers.